Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. You can submit your questions down in the comment section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll aim to answer as many of them as possible. Now, first question this week comes from Josh Spencer, who says, when cycling indoors, he uses a Wahoo Kicker and Kicker Climb, but he's worried about damaging his bike, especially the front forks, when he's sprinting out the saddle, the side-to-side -side movement um, that comes with high-intensity sprints. Is it better to remain seated when sprinting on an indoor trainer? Um, I would say yes, if you can sprint seated, then it's good, you're working on your seated power, which is really important, and that does tend to sort of flex the frame less, I agree. Um, that said, many bikes are designed to be used in an indoor trainer, and you should be safe doing so. Check with the manufacturer of your bike, but for example, Canyon used to say, no, you can't, now they've sort of checked it, tested it, and tweaked the design of their bikes, and they say, yes, you can use our bikes on indoor trainers. Um, if that is the case, it should be fine. But just bear in mind that we did a video recently uh, talking about the lifespan of carbon fiber, and flexing over time will weaken any thing, whether it's carbon fiber, or whether it's steel or aluminum. Um, but that said, a small degree of flexing is designed to happen within the composites and within carbon fiber frames, and they should be able to last a good amount of time doing it. Uh, just if you're Chris Hoy, you'll probably wear out your frame quicker than if you're me. Uh, anyhow, next question is from Chris Bondurant, who has a question about wheels. Good show again, folks. On a flat course, aero wheels will obviously help, but what about the, repeat, the repeated accelerations you get in um, corner sprints in a criterium? Does the energy required to spin up heavier aero wheels uh, out the corners mean that lighter wheels would be better in this scenario? And James Witt has replied going, people who race cars think so and use the lightest wheels possible. I know Ollie disagrees, but I'd go with the lightest wheels you can afford. Yes, I do disagree, James Witt. You're wrong. Uh, we did a video on this as well uh, last year, or was it two years ago, where we spoke to uh, Swiss side and Jean-Paul Ballard, who actually has um, a background working for Sauber and Formula One. And so he knows what he's talking about when it comes to motorsport as well as bike racing. And we modelled a few different scenarios, including um, a criterium where using his mathematical models, he's able to put in the increased aero benefits. He's able to model the accelerations of every corner as you come out and the impact of the added weight and inertia on, on the, the, the wheels and the accelerations and, and whatnot. And overwhelmingly, even in a criterium, and we used real life criterium data for this, it came out overwhelmingly in favor of, of the deeper wheel. The only reason really not to use the deeper wheel is handling, as far as I can see, which it can, when you've got say like an 80 mil wheel in, it can mean that you can't ride with your hands off the bars or it can make the front end more twitchy, which could cause a crash or cause you to come off. And so that is a big reason because you can't get undressed on the bike. It's harder to eat and drink and stuff. And that's a big reason why a lot of pros don't use the deeper wheels. But in a criterium, yeah, I mean, you know, go for it. The maths and physics says that the deeper wheel is faster because you spend more time benefiting from it than overall, than the slight, slight negative of the slight weight penalty out the corners. But you're, you're not coming to a dead stop. You're, you are still carrying speed through the corners, even though you're accelerating. So it, it doesn't really um, count that much against you. So yeah, deeper wheels, go for it. Or check out that video for a more detailed explanation as to why. Uh, Ernst is next and he says, hi, Manon, Ollie, Alex and Connor. Thanks for all the great info. I'd like to know how many miles or intervals is a good rule of thumb to repack my wheel bearings or bottom bracket bearings. He's got sealed bearings in there. I almost always ride on, on dry, clean conditions and keep things clean and never use a power washer to clean this bike. Thanks again for all the great videos. Um, it is a, it's a how, how long is a piece of string question. I do see that you've sort of said that you drive in, like, like, you know, ride in clean conditions and not use a power washer. You know, that's gonna extend the life of your bearings considerably. Um, that said though, I would just say, you're kind of like, just inspect your bike and you'll know if they need replacing. Pick up your cranks, give them a spin, see if there's any side to side play, same with your wheels. If, they're, if they need changing and, and replacing, then they'll, they won't spin as freely and they'll just feel a little bit grainy compared to the free spinning of just 
So um, just inspect them and that way you'll know, but it's impossible to predict how long it will take for that to happen. Um, and when they need changing, change them. Jose uh, Marical Alvarez asks a question saying, hi tech team, I have an Orbea Ordu. Good choice. Uh, and I was not actually going on wanting to do triathlon with it. And I was thinking of what better I should do with it. Maybe should I convert to a road bike or sell it and buy a road bike? I think if you're gonna sell it, just have a look at how much you can get for it. And then what that can get you in terms of a road bike. And if you think that's worth it. If you ride, if you convert it into a, into a road bike, you can do that, it's pretty cool. We've seen a few people do it. I've turned a time trial frame into a drop bar frame before and it's, it can be quite a cool thing. You can make sort of an aero road bike and uh, yeah, but the geometry is not gonna be optimal. That's the, the only thing. So the geometry of a TT bike is different from a road bike, particularly in terms of handling. So TT bikes don't handle anywhere near as well as a road bike. There'll be aero, but the handling is going to be off. So, and it'll often be very low and aggressive at the front end when you convert it. Um, so just consider that before you, before you go any further. And um, yeah, I would do those things. Next question is from Breeder Savarin Hejadal, who says, long time viewer, first time poster. Nice, good to have you on board. Glad we uh, got you to finally type away on the keyboard. Um, he says that he's heard that Shimano 11-speed cassettes work with Campy 11-speed shifters and derailleurs. Right, they do work, but it, it isn't great quality shifting. It'll get you out of a pickle if you need to take a wheel off neutral service, but it's not something I suggest you run as a long-term kind of solution on your bike. Like, don't do it. Just get, the, get a Campy cassette if you're using Campy. Um, but he says, I also read that 12-speed SRAM cassettes work with 12-speed Campagnolo shifters and derailleurs. Um, my question is, what about Shimano 12-speed cassettes on Campy 12-speed? Does it work? So his main question is that, what about Shimano 12-speed cassettes on Campagnolo 12-speed shifters and derailleurs? Does it work? Um, and he's asking this because Shimano 12-speed cassettes can fit on 11-speed hubs. It would open up more possibilities. The internet doesn't have any info on this yet. Um, we've not tried it, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, my, I reckon it's one of those things where it's probably going to work. You probably would because the, the alignment of the derailleur is different. You might have to retune your derailleur and where it's going. And I'd imagine it's probably similar to the 11-speed thing where it does work, but it's not something that you would recommend and it's not something I think you'd want to run on purpose. It's more of something that would get you out of a pickle if you, if you were in trouble and needed a spare wheel or a wheel replacement again. Yeah, um, my guess would be probably stick to what works, what's designed for, for what. Um, again, like Shimano and SRAM can be pretty interchangeable with the cassettes, but again, I do find you get the best shifting when you use the, the, you know, you make the Shimano cassette with the Shimano derailleur. Um, and so I'd probably go for that because it's kind of subtly how it's all designed. Uh, last question this week is from Ime, or Im, who says, uh, hi, my DI2 battery ran flat mid ride and I was left in the small chain ring uh, for the entire ride home. Is there a way to manually change gear, i.e. by hand, if the derailleur runs out of juice? Thanks. Um, not that I'm aware of, uh, unfortunately not. It's happened to me before. I think the thing is just to always check the status of your battery, which is easy to do. You just press the button and see what it's flashing and make sure you, you don't get caught on a low battery. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I think you can, you, you, you perhaps could just pull the derailleur into place, but it's not something I've ever wanted to do because I've feared for damaging the servos inside the derailleur, like forcing them. So yeah. Sorry about that. If anyone actually knows, let us know in the comments section. Maybe someone else does have a solution to that, but as far as I'm aware, there isn't one. The nice thing about SRAM is, of course, you can just swap your batteries uh, from front to rear because the rear one always goes flat first because uh, you use it more. Um, anyhow, that's all we've got time for this week. So I hope we've uh, been able to answer your question. If we've not, sorry about that, but uh, keep firing them down, be persistent, get them in the comment section and we'll aim to get round to it in a future episode of The Tech Clinic. Right, I'm gonna go now. Uh, love you. Bye.